Um, so, welcome to the last single JS for the year. Um, good turnout. Thanks for coming. It's awesome. Um, uh, so, I'm just going to talk a little bit about stuff. Um, and uh, this particular thing I'm going to talk about is why, why we started this thing. Um, or why I started this thing. Basically, uh, my entire career was sort of driven out of like, the interactions that I um, had with people at meetups. So I, I really think that meetups are the, like, some of the most important things that you can do in your professional career. Um, and not only that, JavaScript is also one of the most important things you can do in your professional career. So I thought, combine them, and that's a single JS. Um, that's me. Um, I organized CampJS in Australia. Um, that's going to be happening early next year. Um, just keep an eye out. You guys should come along. It'll be lots of fun. Uh, we basically bring out all kinds of um, interesting people to just hang out, basically. Um, it's sort of, it's like a something between a conference and kind of just like a whole bunch of people hanging out. We have a few organized talks. It goes for a whole weekend, um, and there's alcohol and there's um, space to hack. Um, last time we had, um, we've had Substack out, we've had Max Ogden, we've had um, TJ Holway Chuck, uh, and I, I mean, I just want to point out, the best thing about that is this guy never comes to any conferences at all, ever. He's never been to a conference, I don't think, so maybe one. And he came to my conference, which was awesome. So, um, we're hoping to get other cool um, people. I've actually run out of, um, I've kind of brought all of my favorite people in the world uh, to CampJS already. Like, I've already done them, so I'm going to have to come up with some, I'm gonna, I need some more um, more stars. So, How do you get power? Uh, it, it's not actually camping. I told the designer, it's not camping. <laughs> but I guess the name, he, he was inspired. Um, yeah, it, it's actually, it's like dormitory accommodation, um, kind of like, uh, think about a school camp, but instead of having like, idiots there, you've got a whole bunch of like, super smart, awesome people. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, tonight's agenda, um, this is the order of people, um, but some interesting stuff. I've thrown my thing last because uh, I'm having trouble cutting it down to, 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 to short, so um, if if need be, that will be a half of the talk. Um, so there's some other meetups, but I'm going to let Sani talk about her involvement here. I normally talk about these other things, but uh, basically this is much better than anything I was going to say. <laughs> so um, she'll speak about that in a moment. Um, uh, another thing that we do with Singapore JS is we have, we have a thing book club. Um, it's basically we go through a book and talk about it every once a week. On a Thursday, um, we we just finished uh, functional JavaScript. Um, it was pretty uh, good, I guess, um, because basically I ended up producing a, um, a tool that everybody can use to uh, learn functional JavaScript. So you can download this thing. Uh, it's a, it runs in it's like a node tool. You can install it with npm um, and uh, learn how to do functional JavaScript. Um, so next year, what, what we're hoping to do is pick something interesting. Um, we have a few suggestions, and produce some kind of like interactive lessons for that as well. Uh, and it's all open source; it's all free, um, uh, and it's on that thing. You can go and start some of my repos. Um, thanks to Microsoft for sponsoring the venue. That's really cool. Um, thanks to Neo for sponsoring the other venue, uh, the book club. They're hiring. Uh, they do rails. And we could also do it with some more sponsors. Uh, the reason we don't have pizza is because we don't have a pizza sponsor. Okay. <laughs> so if any, anybody's company wants to get in the good books with JavaScript developers, um, that would be a good idea. And uh, yeah, basically, because we don't have pizza, what we'll do is we'll go out and have dinner afterwards. Um, so uh, who's keen on that? OK, so a few people keen. So uh, if you want to hang out with, with us, we'll probably be going up to Office center over there somewhere. Um, that's it. So I'd like to invite up Michael or Tom to talk about um, to 
talk about just some other stuff. Other stuff. The community. <laughs> <laughs> this is uh, not, not timely, unfortunately, but uh, just as a general, in case you don't know about it. Uh, Hackerspace is a tech community group uh, and co-working space. Uh, it's actually closing its current location this week. Uh, a giant little party on Saturday. Uh, we are expecting to open again uh, in a new venue, hopefully within the end of the year. Uh, we'll do things like host tech events and that kind of stuff. Surprisingly, not this one, but a variety of others, and a whole lot of stuff has started out of there in the past. We have it. So, uh, if contact with other tech people and other fields, particularly the more the hardware guys who do more hardware stuff is of interest. Please uh, have a look at Hackerspace.sg, pop up Google or list if you wish. Uh, information about when it reopens and has a giant opening party. Yes. Yeah. Um, hi guys. Um, so I'm recording the session for tonight. It's actually part of a project, uh, a little project I'm exploring. Uh, I call it engineers.sg. It is a, I have to, oh, okay, I own the domain. <laughs> <laughs> engineers.sg, because there's been a couple of uh, you know, articles in the news about, you know, Singaporeans, Singapore doesn't have engineers, right? But we have a room full of engineers here, so it's just kind of interesting. Uh, I want to showcase the work of engineers and also the user groups that are in town. So engineers at SG. At the moment, you go to engineers at SG. You can be redirected to a video, uh, video playlist, which contains all the meetups of major user groups in Singapore. Uh, you see the PHP meetup uh, videos there. Tonight's JavaScript meetup video will be up there soon, uh, and also other uh, iOS meetup and all those other things which I will slowly add to the collections. Uh, the, the goal of this project is to, to kind of like group concepts. The group concept was to as a pilot to show that hey, how can you actually do this at a low cost and low budget uh, kind of setup. Uh, my, my current setup is, is less than $300, which is pretty fairly uh, affordable. Uh, I want to share that the knowledge with other user groups in town and get them a co-ownership from everyone to create and curate this uh, channel uh, for that we can showcase the work of engineers uh, in town, uh, in Singapore. Um, yeah, this will be like precursor to another project which I have in mind, which I, you guys, well, my friends on Facebook, you probably know about this. I have this idea about doing a little documentary about engineers at work, uh, which basically showcases how what engineers do, how they call it changing the world line by line, and every episode in the documentary will start with this very simple sentence, trust me, I'm an engineer. <laughs> right. So that's only so long that the punchline can work. So <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So that's it. That's a little project I'm working on. So uh, I hope you guys like it. Subscribe to the channel. Subscribe to the playlist. And more news to come when, you know, when I'm ready. So yeah, so that's it. Thanks. <coughs> CSS and JavaScript in a fun way. Okay, cool. Um, so I'm going to use Raspberry Pi, which is known as a $35 little computer. And uh, let me show you one of this right here. Okay. So as you can see here, it has the SD card slot, it has the HDMI uh, slot for monitor, it has two USB. You can put a Wi Fi module, you can put uh, your keyboard. And voila, there you have it, a little computer. So I'm going to pass this around. Um, I am expecting this to be back here. <laughs> <laughs> so just have it a go. <clears throat> so uh, my name is Ayan. You can just go to my website and find my various links. Um, I'm still a very newbie programmer, having started two and a half years ago in web technology. And uh, the way I like to do it, I share whatever I learn. So all these tools that you see here are basic introductions to everything, thanks to Mike and Tim and all everybody that I owe. So I do this uh, every other week or so. And like Tim was saying, um, 
Rebuild.sgi kind of list out the free developer events in Singapore and live.rebuild.sg, we have an internet show every two weeks. And guess who is up in two weeks time? Way right here. <laughs> That's episode eight. Episode one was Mike Chang. And a lot of you in the audience will be in future episodes, but she'll be talking about agile development and being an effective tech conference speaker. So join us live from your bedroom. <laughs> no cameras. <clears throat> okay. So let me talk about the little setup that I have here. So what do you need for a Raspberry Pi? So this is the little computer that you have. Uh, the USB is right here, you have two slots. So one of them I put in the Wi-Fi module. I bought this from the Adafruit, but you can just kind of Google a Wi-Fi module. And the second thing you need is the SD card, four gigabyte uh, generally. Here you can basically have an image of an operating system. Uh, it can be Raspbian, it can be Arch Linux, the one that I'm running Google Coder is based on Raspbian, and the Google team in New York basically added Node.js to it, uh, albeit is a 0.6 version. Yeah, I know, they haven't updated it. Uh, I know, it's a security flaw, but uh, since it will be in a local network, I think it's fine. Huh? Don't just expose it to the global internet. So that's what we need. Uh, next, we need a micro USB power supply, okay, and then, um, for the purpose of this demo, because I want you guys to connect to it, I'm having a router. Because if you connect to the Raspberry Pi itself, uh, it probably it's not that powerful. So I am also having a router. The setup is right here. I think after the talks, you guys can check it out. And students laptop. So uh, for the purpose of a scenario, all of your students, it might not be laptop, it can be a mobile phone or your iPad. Later on, I will tell you the password and you can log into it. So basically, this is the setup, pretty easy. Uh, so what we're going to do is we're going to download the coder. So the coder website is this. I've chosen the Wi-Fi version right here. And you can basically download it. Once you download, you will have this application right here. And you can just click this. And uh, using a uh, SD card just like this. So firstly, it will ask you to take out any SD card so that uh, it can detect. Then you just, uh, if you're using a MacBook, uh, I believe most of us should have an SD card slot there. And uh, then you can uh, basically remove, start. Oh my god. Okay. And uh, then you can basically format it. It's uh, pretty user friendly as uh, opposed to other operating systems meant for this. But I'll not run through this. I already have the image prepared in that one. And uh, after this, what you're going to do is connect up the Raspberry Pi. So here I have the Raspberry Pi right here. It's running, so this is the SD card, this is the power, and this is the Wi-Fi module. It's running right here. And uh, all you do is, uh, so let me show you. So I can now uh, go in, uh, come to my laptop, access coder.local, and over here at the gear setup, you can go to Wi-Fi setup, which I've already done previously. <coughs> and basically select the network, which is a talk JS router, which is my router right here. Okay, so I will not do this because I've already done this. And uh, once you do that, uh, ready for the demo? Okay, I will not give you, oh no, I will not give you the password. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want you to crash before I show you guys. So, <laughs> so this is actually built with uh, the coder itself. As you can see here, uh, there's this little thing. If you click here, you'll have the HTML, CSS, JavaScript, but if you click this little I, you see that it will be split. So it becomes very easy for a beginner to write here Google Coder, and then you can just press save, and it will immediately update right here. So I know you might be wondering, hey, you know, you can probably do this uh, by a computer. I mean, uh, yes, of course you can. But what I was thinking, if you go to a village and there is no internet connection, you can just set up a local network and teach a bunch of kids like that. Uh, secondly, um, I've done, quite a bit of teaching, what I felt was uh, when you come to this interface, when I go to coder interface right here, you can actually create boxes. So the teacher standing right here can see what the students are creating out there instead of going individually. So you can create like a Roland box, a my box, and you can actually see the code here. So for example, let's go to the eyeball here, which comes by default, you can actually play with it. Or more importantly, you can look at the code and then you can look at the node, the JavaScript, CSS. You can also upload media, which means in terms of uh, pictures. So it's uh, really easy, and you can just write your name and stuff. All right, uh, 
so why don't we all try it? Uh, I don't know whether it will crash or not. So uh, let me go back here, Tom.js. Okay, so uh, all of you go to the Wi-Fi setting top JS router, which is right here. And uh, in your browser, go to HTTPS, okay? HTTPS, quarter double over. Maybe I should edit it right now. See, this is the cool thing about it. Come here. HTTPS. Talk JS one 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 one, which is today's date. What's the Talk JS one 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 one, today's date. So let me show you uh, what's the password. So you can you can of course use. Um, your mobile phone or your iPad as well. So uh, go ahead and create a box or so, <coughs> which is uh, HTTPS and RJS. I don't know why it's like that. Could you guys like uh, connect to it? Can I connect to the Wi-Fi? Yeah, and in your browser, go to HTTPS quarter dot local. <laughs> it's not trusted. Yeah, proceed anyway. Yeah, proceed. Come on, guys. Is it self Yeah, I got. Yeah, just come on. Trust me. Do it. Trust me. For those who can't get in, uh, zero configuration mode. I believe the IP is one nine two dot one six seven. One nine two dot one six eight dot ten dot two dot two dot two one two. You can try the IP address. I don't know how many of you can get in, but um, I probably need a better router. Before we need a, we probably need a Raspberry Pi. Uh, yeah. I got in briefly. Yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I guess a lot of you are trying to get in. Um, refresh? Yeah, let me refresh. I mean, did anybody create something? So let me refresh and see. Maybe it'll, mine will also crash. Yeah, it, it, it is taking time. Yeah. <laughs> Has there been any success stories like where Google used this or who has been using it? Have any no, no, I have not heard of such. It's very What's the point? What is it? What's the point? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's no point. Um, but I felt uh, like uh, if you have a place without internet connection, you can create modules like okay let's say header run tags or DOM elements and then you can create boxes and teach well, kids. There's also a possibility to use for someone to just get a cheap computer yes. and just tinker with the computer yeah. with, them, with people who yeah. don't have a lot of money to see how exactly. it's going to work. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I don't need to be worried about your kids playing too many games with the Raspberry Pi. It's not as much of an issue. Yeah. So, so it's primarily a teaching tool. It's not it is it's absolutely a teaching tool not to computer. build this stuff. Yeah. Yes. Primarily. Yes. Definitely. Yes. It's very new. It's very new. It's in September, I think. Yeah, it's like a yeah. even VL, but I think a lot of people <coughs> do it. Google's case, so. <laughs> Google's case. Yeah, that's all I have. So check out Raspberry Pi. Um, I'm actually getting into this thing called Internet of Things, and in the last, in the next year or so, I'll be working a lot with Node and setting up lightweight web servers and connecting sensors to stuff. So I was, uh, this was like one of my first projects to get into Internet of Things and I'm pretty excited about it. Hope you share more how physical things get connected with JavaScript and such. In future videos. That's it. Thank you. The root has crashed. Yes. It is. the yeah, and I would be a lot more the But I think we need to
Hi everyone, I'm uh, Steve. I'm working in a bank. Yeah, the last person to have, uh, you should have ever seen here. <laughs> okay, anyway, today I'm going to talk about goals. And uh, it's uh, actually, how many of you have heard of goals? Okay, majority, maybe not majority, half of you all. So, how many of you all have tried goals? Okay, there are only two, and me, that's three. How many of you all believe in goals? <laughs> oh man! Okay, okay. I I will. I won't try to sell it. I will give it from my point of view. But first, I'll just take the rest into what is goals all about. Okay, so basically, right? It's just a blogging platform. Um, the reason why WordPress here, right? It's because the guy who created it is uh, John no no Nolan. Uh, he was actually a developer and a, de and a designer for the WordPress team. So that was his vision. Um. He wanted what was not like you know when you started with WordPress like nine years ago, it was just a blogging engine, and before that uh, it was actually just a, it's from B two blog then it became WordPress. But over the years, right over over the last nine years, it has evolved into something much bigger than, than a blog. It is actually uh, more more or less a CMS, it's a framework, it's everything. So his vision was actually to have something right which is just a blogging platform, as simple as that, and um. How many, how many of you here have seen the Kickstarter? Okay, so quite a number also. Um, if you look at the values, right? £25,000, uh, total pledge £200,000. So it's about eight times. I think popularity-wise, it speaks for, uh, for itself. Um, yeah, but I didn't uh, go into it. I was aiming for the Ubuntu H the other time. That's more one. <laughs> okay, so anyway, uh, more, more or less it's open source, MIT <coughs> license. And non-profit. So basically, right? Uh, he and this uh, H Hannah Wolf, they actually set up the Ghost Foundation. It's non-profit, and basically every cent that you put into their foundation, uh, you will go back to the foundation. So it's to sustain themselves, uh. um, How are they earning this money? They're going to have a Ghost uh, hosting service. So yeah, and they have made it quite clear that uh, they are, they don't want to be acquired. Yeah. So because. Anyway, Okay, so just move on, uh, wrap up. Soon. So the whole idea of it is actually boils down to one simple idea: publishing done right. Okay, so how do how do they want to achieve this? Uh, firstly, you have a uh, markdown live editing. So uh, you edit on the left, you see the results on the right. Simple as that. Intuitive. Um, I think the only one I've seen so far like this is the there's this app on Mac OS. It's called Mo. Yeah, but now they're bringing it all over to the platform. So it's actually yeah, it's actually quite intuitive. Yeah. Okay, next, uh, simple content <coughs> management. The first thing you see uh, when you go in, right, it's actually this screen. Uh, your post on the left, your stuff, and the quick preview on the right, things like that. So, uh, maybe uh, can anyone answer what is the first thing they will see when they go into WordPress? I don't know. Yeah, welcome, then like a lot of numbers here, posts, stuff like that. That's what I remember, I haven't used for a long time. Okay, anyway, uh, next thing, uh, well-designed dashboard, uh, also also they say, I would think that it, it gets to the point. 
um, there's a focus on statistics over here which might or might not ben benefit it might not, be, might, might not be, be, benefit the, the blogger itself because some, some people they are just like maybe the top of bloggers they are more concentrated on like you know they are more focused on wanting to know what is their stats you know but I think for the rest not really it doesn't really matter um, but at the end of the day right um, this dashboard right uh, they want you to <coughs> develop widgets for it and it's just drag and drop configurable here and there as simple as that uh, fully responsive not that it's very hard to do yeah, but uh, but when I say fully responsive, right? Um, even their back end is fully responsive. I tried my mobile phone; it's not too bad. It's workable, it's doable. Yeah. Okay, and many more to come. You can see the roadmap and the uh, planned features. So currently, the version is at zero point three three. Uh, December will be zero point four. Um, I'll take you all through. Like, let's see what they they have so far. Okay, so this is a roadmap. Uh, they're going to support uh, maybe S SEO, um, static pages, cache headers, stuff like that. Um, we shall look at the okay, and the plan features. So basically, right, if you look at to summarize this thing, right, uh, whatever that's here, right, it's actually whatever is the WordPress it is. So in terms of maturity level, right, it's uh it's still fairly, I would say, uh, bare minimal. You definitely can block or something. Um, but in terms of the extra features, right, you will have to come in over the next one year or so. Okay. So anyway, okay. So uh, I'll just give you the ghost version of the five minutes in store. Okay. Okay. So um, I'm going to. Yeah. <coughs> yeah. So that's the ghost package. Um, you can actually download from the GitHub itself. Uh, it's somewhere. Uh, yeah, somewhere there. <laughs> okay, never mind. Forget it. Okay. So anyway, right. Uh, the first thing you would do, right, is actually to uh, to change the config file. Basically, they don't really have like the like, you know you you uh, you unzip like WordPress, and you straight away get a setup page. No, you don't get that. But what you have to do, right, is actually <coughs> to copy the config uh, example. Yes, and yep, that's it. And, and you have to configure your URL. So. Lucky for me, I actually uh, copied already. Ah. Yeah, okay. Next thing you do is to production. Oh, actually, that was supposed to be for this. Okay, the host, right, uh, by default is binded to uh, 127, you know, the local host. Uh, which should be the case because in end of the day, right, you want to host it and then let NGX do its own job. Yep. But in this case, we're just pointing it like that. Uh, so we can get it off to the world. And um, if you look at something interesting over here, right, by default, right, their client is actually a SQL electric. So you get a fully you no know, database setup, whatever. Uh, the database support so far from what I know, right? Uh, MySQL and, and SQLite. Yeah, I think some got out the WordPress, uh, no Mongo, no, no whatever, no whatever. Yeah, so it's fairly basic. Okay, that's it. And we will... Yep, I think we are running about two minutes.
Okay, so by default, right? Let's try it works. Okay, so basically, right, this is the first thing you see. Uh, the default team is uh, Casper, it's their own team. Uh, it's like that. Okay, the admin console, right, it's uh, just a slash go. Oops, sorry. Okay, so you put in your name. So this is, uh, like I said, this, this was actually the first page we didn't install. Uh, post on the left, things on the right. So get this out. Okay, so if you notice, right, um, what happens is that when you edit the post, right, you actually get your live editing. So keyboard shortcuts are not enabled. So. Yeah, that was control B. Okay. Um, fairly basic, there's a text on the bottom here. Yeah, just pu publish or draft. Nothing, no, no uh, future publish, not yet. It's really, really minimal. So if you look at, uh, oh yeah, I want to show you something also. Okay. So anyway, um, let's uh, rename the blog. I'm yes. uh, going to focus today on uh, showing my cats. So if you have like images which you wanted to add inside here, right? What you can do is actually to uh, give, a, give you a box and then you just uh, add stuff on the right. Uh, you automatically publish, the automatically upload, sorry. And then you get them. So stuff like that. Um, fairly intuitive, fairly simple. Um, Itself. Uh, basically, right, um, if you look over here, right, you can actually see like we have like API calls. So it's actually uh, it's all fully API stuff running on Jason. And, um, yeah, okay. and um, it's actually running on, uh, on Connect. So, yeah, so node stuff. Uh, the Teams, right, the Teams is interesting. Maybe not so interesting. Uh, but let's see. So uh, this is the tips folder and uh, test for and So it's actually all handlebars. Uh, yeah. So if you know handlebars, you know how to. Yeah. And um, the structure of it, right? It's actually uh, the same as WordPress. You have. Okay. So in this case, right, you have a, you have a few files. Uh, default is like the skeleton. Okay. Uh, index is like your main page. Post is like your 
yeah, your post, your single post itself. So basically, that's about it. Uh. Yeah. Maybe just to show you how it looks like. Yeah. Uh, one thing to note, right? Comments don't come out of the box. In fact, they are not going to support comments. Uh, they just ask you to you know, just uh, have to, uh, discuss or something. Yeah. So uh, maybe just to show you how simple is it. get a fully functional site work, uh, probably about no more than 30 minutes, more or less. Okay, so anyway, just to move on. Okay, so it's more than 5 minutes, anyway. the initial launch partners, right? What's in interesting about them is that they actually have quite a few types. Uh, like for me, I would recognize uh, and, and Basha and Wolfins, they are big, uh, like World Teams is mixed, they, they, they make teams and Basho is like you know, big marketplace for teams and stuff like that so if you look at it right, they actually start out very strong um, in terms of how it might go from here it's really up to the community itself to actually build teams or plugins for them and stuff like that and uh, this is actually their marketplace um, It's it's rare, it's really rare preview, uh, free stuff, get stuff, submit stuff, you know, okay, just, just this two. Um, and, and from what you have seen so far, right, I mean, it's running on Node, so basically you need to have access to the, 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 the command line. Um, so in terms of platform support, right now, right, uh, these are the few holes which are like, uh, supporting it. So, like, okay. okay, so if you really want to try it, you just go to these two links. Okay, so my thoughts about it, right? Um, okay, so what I feel about goals, right? It's it's like Anakin Skywalker. He's like he has he he he's young now, but he will grow and he will become very powerful. That's what I feel about it. Um, but he can also be a very badass. Um, he could go both ways. He could go for the good, or he could go for the bad, like the bad, you know. Okay. So why I so why I feel about this way right is that um, if we look at how WordPress has become right, I feel that when people are attracted to the power of goals and they start flocking over towards it right, um, they will want to build a lot of stuff. They want to expect a lot of stuff out of this uh, this platform itself. So eventually right, my gut feeling tells me that it might grow the, towards the same direction of it also. But I mean that's just pure speculation. But I mean that's. Uh, that feel I have. And secondly, right, in terms of like the traction of support uh, for growth, right, um, I think the majority of support has to come from uh, those who are doing shared posting now. Because basically, right, uh, it runs on Node, and most of the shared hosts out there now don't run Node. Yeah. Okay? You will, only those v, the, the VPS and stuff. So maybe this would push them towards an, an, an enabling Node on their web posting, which is good for everyone, I mean for the JavaScript com community in nature. Uh, but if they don't really want to follow that direction, right, it could also end quite badly for them. And it will just become a project which, you know, after one year no one speaks, speaks, speaks about, or is very limited. So that's like my two cents on it. Let me see if I have anything. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So other than that, um, I think it's going to be quite interesting. Uh, next month they're going to re release your platform. There's going to be plugin support, and stuff like that. So maybe people start building stuff then, and who knows? It might actually take off from there. Yeah. Okay. Any questions? So it runs a database. Oh yeah. Uh, now it's on SQLite. Right? Uh, you can put it on SQL. I think database support wise, it's still fairly basic. They're trying to get everything up. There's just too much to get up. And does it generate static? Not for now. Next version, I think. Uh, I, I, 
everything. What was false? Yes, false and everything. The files are, yeah, it's an upload. Just start the file system. Yeah, okay. You can't ask questions like that. Does it have potential for a CMS system? Does it have potential for a CMS system? Sorry? CMS, CMS, right? I think it, um, <coughs> at this moment, custom de designs definitely yes. What you saw just now is actually a simple thing. <coughs> uh, you can have your own designs. Uh, forums and stuff like that probably have to go through the plugins. I don't think they are going to develop, the developers are going to go towards that direction. So it's going to be, uh, they have actually mentioned that they want 100% involvement from the community itself. So if there's anything going to be like that, right, it's going to be built by the, by the community. Yeah. Can I go close to the import and say from, post from WordPress? Yeah. Uh, not too sure if there are, I think there is. Uh, but basically, the import format is actually in JSON, so if you can convert it somehow into that format, right, you can bring it in. Yeah. Um, I think I saw this. Uh, it actually there's this tool that uh, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's another guy's uh, tool that uh, generates uh, static pages for GitHub. Yeah. But I think over, over time it will come up on its own. Yeah. Yeah. So it's actually quite interesting to see whether. Uh, People who want to do us go to the Jackal way, stuff like that. Okay. Thank you. So it's a, it's a tiny bit more theoretical, but hopefully it'll give you some new ideas when it comes to object orientation. Uh, what is method dispatch in general? So usually when you have something that is called a polymorphic method, you have multiple implementations for the method, and when you call the method, dispatch is used to determine which of the implementations to use. So in JavaScript, you have a single dispatch. That means a single value is used to determine what method or what code will be called in the end. And a, a good example is toString. toString is a, a polymorphic method. You can implement it in your own constructor, and then it does its own thing. And there are many implementations of toString. Um, on the other hand, so and, and what this talk is about is multiple dispatch. And there, you use multiple values to determine what implementation will be called in the end. So um, this is an example of a polymorphic method. Um, 
here you call it by a single dispatch, by a chain dot describe, and you have two different implementations. You have one for person with a function, and the other method is in employee. The, and the kind of the analogous way of using a function for the same thing is called a generic function. And here, the dispatch does not happen by a chain, <coughs> it happens by a describe. So now, the function is the top level construct, but you still have dispatch. And inside, you kind of, this is not how it's actually like the, the languages that, that do it this way have fast implementations, but this is kind of the idea how you would program it in code. So you check if the instance is an instance of person, and then you do whatever is done up here. Uh, and if it's not a person, you check if it's an employee, and then you do what's done up here. So that is kind of the whole thing turned inside out. Um, and with generic functions, you have the advantage that if you have more than a single parameter, um, the system works as well. So here you have plus, and you have two operators, op1 <coughs> and op2. And you want to do different things depending on whether you're adding a number to a string or a string to a number. And again, you do these kind of instance off checks or type of checks, the, the type checks. And then you uh, perform whatever is uh, appropriate for these, uh, for these types. So this is kind of like a table. And where the table is just the, the receiver of the method call, um, here it's actually the table is about the parameters. And if you ever, you could actually relatively easily implement multiple dispatch via uh, a library in JavaScript, and this is how you would do it first. You would create a generic function as kind of an object, and then you would add methods, kind of like cases to it. And these cases and numbers have multiple dispatch and generic functions, they're actually called methods because they're very, like these cases you add are very, very similar to methods in JavaScript. And here you again you see the, the idea of having a table these are the types of the parameters, and this is the code that handles the specific case of adding a number to a <coughs> string or adding a string to a number, or vice versa. Um, and this is how you would call it. You would call uh, the, the object like this, and then internally it would go through the table and pick the appropriate So what are the benefits? It's at first glance it looks a bit weird, especially if you're used to single dispatch, and it's kind of the dominant way of doing dispatch. Um, but you get several really nice benefits, and in, in, in many ways it's more complementary to how JavaScript does method calls. So what's the advantage? Um, what happens is you get symmetry. Um, this doesn't have this kind of special um, role anymore, um, the parameters are become as important, and functions become object-oriented now, they are now aware of the type hierarchy. The benefits you get from that is it's useful whenever you have an algorithm that spans multiple objects. For example here, if you have, if foo is an algorithm that does something, and it depends on collaborators. So this is not this is not data. These are actually helpers. So object one, object two, ob object three, they help foo. And then with single dispatch, you have kind of have the problem. Okay, uh, now I have to put it into a method. But which of the objects should foo reside in? That's that's weird. So you 
Um, because it crosses, it crosses all objects. It's, it's not, it, yeah, it, it shouldn't live in a single object, it should live in all objects at the same time, it's cross-cutting. Um, and generic functions actually allow you to extract this kind of algorithm <coughs> into a function um, and, and still have this kind of, uh, and still have polymorphism. And the other advantage is you can also easily extend um, classes or, well, in JavaScript constructors and soon classes. Um, but you, you get this kind of object-oriented function and it's just, it's very easy to create it. And with um, JavaScript, if you want to add something to an existing constructor, it's always very messy. And there's always a problem of you adding something that ends up being used by someone else as well, or right now they have problems with, they want to add new um, methods for ECMAScript 6, and sometimes the uh, existing code has already used the same name, and then you have uh, bad clashes. And with polymorphic, uh, with generic functions, you don't have that problem. And one last example where, um, Multiple dispatch clearly makes sense. It's the visitor pattern. Who of you have, uh, know the visitor pattern? It's it's a very uh, obscure kind of thing. It's um, and the idea is simple, but how you implement it is always there's a lot of boilerplate involved. And the problem is, you if you have data and you want to have different algorithms that work for the data. So um, a classic example is, let's say you have an expression that is parsed in a programming language. And you want to print it in different formats. You want to print it in plain text, in HTML, maybe LaTeX or something. Um, then you have a split. On one hand, you have the data structure, which is the expression. On the other hand, you have the algorithm, which is the printing. And <coughs> with um, normal object orientation, you, you, you cannot modularly, or what you would do is you would add printing to the expression. And then you would have uh, print HTML for plus, for minus, for parentheses, and so on. Um, and then you would have print plain text and so on. Um, but if you want to extract it and have it like kind of pluggable and modular somewhere else in, in a single object, um, you cannot, well, cleanly do that in, with single dispatch. And the, the visitor pattern is kind of a workaround. And you split the, uh, you split the roles so on one hand, you have the algorithm, which is the visitor. And then you have the data, which is called the client and the pattern. And you can actually look it up on, on Wikipedia where you have a, a class diagram. And then the data accepts the algorithm. And the data tells the visitor, um, I'm plus um, do do your thing with plus, or I'm parentheses, do your thing with parentheses. And then you, you get kind of this, this back and forth. And it's, um, you can look it up, it's, it's not very intuitive. Um, on the other hand, with multiple dispatch patch, it becomes trivial, because you, you, you have a single function that is called visitor, you have the parameter, which is the data. And then for each of the different kinds of expressions, for plus, for parentheses, and so on, you add a case to visitor. And one visitor would be print HTML. Uh, one visitor would be, and a, a different function would be uh, print plain text. So per algorithm, you have one function, it becomes very, very simple. And with the visitor pattern, uh, it's always a bit of a, of a brain teaser. 
So there are a few languages that have multiple dispatch, and um, it's and once you learn, it's actually fairly natural. Uh, common Lisp, Haskell, R, Groovy, Clojure, and C Sharp have it. So it's, it's exotic, but not as exotic as you may think. So thank you. Any questions? Ask me. Or well, if you have a quick one now. Or are you weirded out now? <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, this is our web service. The background is, background is Java and Scala. And uh, of course, we are using JavaScript in the ITML, but you can see that here, the JavaScript is written in uh, ACR. So this is very difficult to test here. So I am trying to uh, move this and the JavaScript to the uh, other file. And now I am. Oops, Okay, so the AMD and the request is the final solution for my uh, my problem. How many developers know the request is? Over. Oh, uh, thank you. Yes, so I will skip the what is AMD and now just now I will show the what is request is. Request is is just a module loader. Okay, you can see that this is a kind of uh, one of the module. It just have a jQuery. This depends on jQuery and show the hello world. And uh, you can copy it from this <coughs> When you want to refuse the modules, uh, what you have to do is just explain that I need a module. I need a module here and then the uh, system. So you can just pass the module up here. 
have the European lower boundary the argument over the process. Then you can see that this model uh, there's coffee scary up. Don't you write coffee? When <laughs> 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 you put it that way, it's hard to say yes. And then maybe I, I need to change the extra extra extension to that coffee. What's the point? Okay, uh, the motivation of the recages, so as you say, the recages is not a uh, only one solution. You, you can say that well, uh, you can use the kind of homogeneous model. I don't think that homogeneous is not so good for the solution for the browser. So, my motivation to use the client is, and, uh, and first is useful configuration. The recages has a lot of configuration, so you can customize. The way that you put the JavaScript and modules, or how to optimize them to your program, <coughs> and the useful tools. The required JS is uh, has uh, some tools like Arduino JS is just optimizer. Optimizer let you to optimize your files, modules. Yes, and Arduino JS is a uh, uh, simple, simple executor of AMD. It means that you don't. You don't uh, distribute your requests. A request is not so small JavaScript. So if you want to um, uh, make uh, the package of your <coughs> product and you want to reduce the size of the JavaScript, then you can use ARM.js, and then you don't have to reduce so big the module loader. Just a simple module loader is enough. And first, third, ARM.js, this is not a member of the required JS community, but uh, you can use this module. So from now I will explain the two use cases what I already know. The first is genius optimization. Yeah. The before optimization, I mean that when you develop some tools, that you do not have to combine uh, so much of sources and you do not have to uh, minify your files, right? If you minify your right, the files that you need you need to read the console complex code. Uh, of course we have so much now we can use so much but if you, uh, I don't think that uh, we should use so much in the development space. At that time, you can download the, your modules public, public, one, but just one file, one file, one file. And you do not have to, uh, uh, you, and you take the edit. But uh, you can disable the browser cache, because maybe uh, you, you modify some JavaScript files, and you want to download the fresh one. So the idea is we will help you to save your browser cache. And after my optimization, the the RegularJS, not the RegularJS, but RJS, RJS, we uh, optimize your uh, optimize. Optimize means that combine and minify. The optimization is made by the first. First is a com combination, and second is minify. Yeah. And minification. Yeah. So it means that you do not have to. Uh, your customer does not have to download so much at like 100 or 100. Yeah. 100 or 1,000, I add so much for the just to download the required JS and your model, then your customer can enjoy your product. Yes. And uh, at that time, you don't have to disable browser cache. So you want to make, uh, you want to use the browser cache uh, to, make, to make your system uh, easy to use. Yes. And the second use case I already you uh, is the CDN fallback. Maybe your, pro your product is already used the CDN, right? You have to do CDN run it. Right? So, do you have a fallback code? Uh, I mean, that when Google stops with their work, as uh, in Google server is just how about your code? How do you product? I think that if you have no fallback, your server will be dead. Okay. What about fallback to require this Fallback is so you can distribute the requests itself by from your domain and your, your host. So if your server is working, then there is no problem. If your server is down, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing to talk about. You should wake up and call your customers. Yeah, the here is the Wow. <laughs> Yeah, you can see this is just a simple configuration. What you have to do is uh, first uh, you have to clear the file of the app in the Explorer. It's sorry for Microsoft. 
<laughs> and second is uh, you, have, you can explain that where is the jQuery. Where is the jQuery? First, of course, you can put the, the pass on the CDN, pass on the CDN, the Google. And the second, if the, this um, pass can't work, then the, you require this, you try the second one, deep the jQuery, search jQuery. In, that, in this <coughs> case, the, your customer has to download the external files, so maybe the performance is not so good. But this is better than stopping your service. Right? Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah, here is more documents, but uh, kind of you cannot click this screen, so I uh, publish this gist to uh, the public list. So please search uh, my name, the year, 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 H6. Uh, this is the name of the, my GitHub accounts and the Twitter accounts. And uh, I will uh, uh, distribute my file <coughs> on Twitter. And uh, I have a totally, you can see. Oh, oh yes. I have a GitHub. On the GitHub, I have a best practice. And you can build the, my the source code and try to how to optimize your files right, by the grant. Yeah. And you can enjoy, in, you can learn and enjoy your monitor how to use requests. Yeah. This is all for my presentation. Thank you. Do you have a question? Maybe. Uh, um, during the, the flash days, there used to be like cool loader sliders. When you load from that <coughs> website, I was wondering if there is any kind of um, you know, like loaders which looks which works with uh, Python JS and shows you the progress as it downloads the Python JS. You mean that you want to display the sound spinner during your uh, your yes, correct, downloading and outputs the huge JavaScript files? Of course you can. Of course you can. The first you want to you should download a small and small mm, small module to show the spinner. I think the spinner this cannot be so huge for it. The first you, to, you should download this one and this page. And uh, after that you can start downloading other modules. Uh, either in my the how to say the best practice has no example like that, but uh, so can we try and make an example? Okay. If you put access to the script tag, I believe that um, in the newer browsers, you know, you get events, like progress events, and at least load events. So I'm not sure if the Python is not sure you access to the uh, ads, but if you, if you can, if, I mean, worst case scenario, you just run a loop that detects new script tags on the page or something like that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That all. Thank you. Is like um, yeah, it's one option, uh, and there's a lot of uh, discussion at the moment about the best way to do these kinds of things. Um, I will post. A, I don't have the internet right now, but there's a, a guy called. I don't remember his name actually now, but I'll post. A, there's a there's a discussion on a gist um, about this stuff because basically there's like three different versions of three and a half. You've got Require and uh, RequireJS and AMD, who basically you're, you're plugging in um, a, an asynchronous tool, but it kind of like works at runtime. You've got um, you've got component and you've got um, Browserify, which is like requires a build step. So you run a build step. They give you um, kind of like sync. They give you synchronous requires, and it's a little kind of neater. Um, it's a, it's a lot. A lot neater, actually. Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, I like it. Um, and there's also some interesting stuff which is coming up in ES6, which is like ES6 has its own module loading mechanism, 
uh, and they're all different and they all have pros and cons. Uh, but the point that I want to make is NPM. NPM is this amazing, massive library of code. You know, and these other module systems that aren't compatible with it are just saying, oh, I don't need all that code. Well, I'm happy to rebuild everything. Uh, and I've, I think anything that's like not compatible with NPM is like making an incredible sacrifice, uh, whether they know it or not. Uh, just because, okay, at the moment, uh, NPM is primarily node modules, but you can also put, you can put anything on there. And there's also, just through chance, a lot of stuff that works for Node also just works for the browser. And I mean, that's one of the key things that Browserify gives you, is that um, a lot of the built-in stuff in Node gets uh, replaced with something like an equivalent in uh, for the browser. So for example, uh, in, the, in Node, you can say you know, require FS to pull in the file system module, which allows you to then uh, read and uh, write files. Um, so there's modules, uh, transforms for Browserify, which will uh, allow you to at least read files um, exactly using the exact same syntax as you would in Node, but in the browser. And basically, it, it inlines the file into your into your script, so that when you actually require it, all it does is just like returns a string. Anyway, the, the long term thing is that uh, most people will move to, or even NPM will move to the ECMAScript six. Yeah, I'm not sure. I, there's there's been a discussion about about that they probably <coughs> won't move to the new syntax and I'm not sure about that either so again like the new syntax for ES6 um, it's weird like it, it well it's weird because it introduces new keywords for like expose for uh, attaching stuff to the local scope I don't know we've already got like two keywords now for attaching stuff to the local scope why do we need you know anyway uh, an initial argument to address that which is right now the center of gravity for the package collection is NPM yeah Sort of track it. If, yeah. it's, if it adds new syntax, then use it. If not, so there's lots of there's lots of um, discussions, and uh, like it's sometimes it's fun just to pick one side and just just be really um, opinionated. So that's what I'm doing. Um, so that's not what my talk's about. Uh, I'm talking about shadow DOM. Thanks. Uh, what the hell am I doing? Uh, Okay, so I have to run this in Canary because the thing I have to do to make it work in Chrome sucks. Uh, so, oh yeah. There we go. Alright. So, I, I found the whole concept of ShadowDOM kind of confusing uh, at first and I didn't really, what the hell is it? And part of the trick with a lot of these programming things is that they, they throw words out and you try to map them to concepts that you already have um, but you don't have anything. Um, so, I uh, like, I didn't get like what what does the word shadow have to do with anything and in fact I kind of feel like I got it around the wrong way but anyway the light DOM is what you're using now so when you're using well in the these terms um, so the light DOM is uh, if you know if I open up uh, here uh, and I look at this thing the this is the light DOM and the shadow DOM is what I'm talking about today and it's uh, something which is kind of coupled uh, packaged up with like uh, this whole web components movement um, and it'll be coming soon, so you should learn about it. <laughs> so, shadow, the basic idea of Shadow DOM is that it takes uh, an element, so let's say you've got a button, or in this case we've got an H3, that's all, that one there, um, and it completely replaces its, visual, its visuals. So if I click on this code, that runs it. Um, so we've completely replaced our H3 with this um, Shadow DOM, um, and in this case, the Shadow DOM has nothing in it, so our item completely disappears. So the Shadow DOM itself, it's kind of like having a, uh, it's, a whole tr it's a whole document that lives inside a DOM node. Uh, and yeah, it, it's yeah, like a mini iframe that lives inside an element. So for example here, um, I create my Shadow root, which is kind of like creating like a new document um, inside our H3. And then I just set its inner HTML to be this um, you know, A tag. And if I run this code, um, our H3 has been replaced with this A tag. Um, so you can kind of think of uh, HTML being a model and the Shadow DOM is your view. Kind of. 
So uh, some other things that you can do here is, sorry about that, but uh, so I've got, that's that thing there. Basically, when you create the shadow root, um, you can know, inject some stuff. Now this, this is an interesting new tag. Basically what this does, it takes your original item and injects it into the shadow DOM. So you've got an item, you've created a shadow root, so it pulls it out of the document and replaces it with this, um, with this new tree, right? Um, and at this point it's got nothing in it. Then we put in a, an anchor, so that'll display. And then we take the original node and we put it into the shadow DOM tree. So that's how that works. And so if we run, if we look at this, what will happen is we'll end up with a link that says shadow DOM on the left and we we'll, should have the original, this thing, on the right. So let's run it and it worked. So that there is probably like, that's the most important thing to understand in this thing because that, that was the part that I really struggled with um, when I was trying to figure out what the hell this thing was. But that's basically it. How is this useful? So uh, do you guys remember semantic markup and actually trying to do this uh, recently? Uh, it kind of sucks. Um, you know, I mean, the whole idea was, you know, we're trying to decouple our content from our presentation. So, you know, this is like old 90s, early 2000s, probably banks in Singapore style. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> um, but, you know, you, you end up with, you've got a, an element here which um, doesn't say anything about what it is, it just describes its presentation. And so that was bad, and we moved to this um, CSS thing. Um, but, and you know, we were trying to get away from, like people were using tables for doing layouts and things like that, uh, but we've kind of created pretty much the exact same problem. It's a little bit better uh, in the fact that div doesn't have any meaning, but we end up with like this spam of divs everywhere. Um, so CSS is really good for um, handling, you know, like one element at a time, but it kind of sucks when you're trying to build an application with it. And it also, uh, I mean, layout is really a problem with it. And so, so this is something which you'll, you, know, you commonly see in your know, programs, you'll see nested divs to achieve some effects. So this is, this is vertically centering content. Um, and in fact, the reason why this is up at the top of the page is because I couldn't be bothered doing all this. You know, like it's just a, uh, just a padding at the top. But it, it's a lot of work doing vertical centering. You've got to add extra elements. And I actually feel bad at, when I'm adding um, elements to my DOM that aren't semantic. So yeah, our div is really semantic. Uh, this is from Bootstrap. I mean, this is kind of becoming like common. This is really easy. It's really convenient to produce stuff with it, but we've completely lost the whole concept of semantic markup. Um, so, but there are things getting better, and there's progress on both ends. So we've got progress coming in from the HTML. Like HTML is getting better. Um, so HTML5, HTML5 has um, you know, these new elements, there's a hell of a lot more, but these are just like you know, particularly useful ones. Uh, we're doing, is it header? Oh, whoops. <laughs> it renders the same. Uh, header, that's <laughs> header, name, side, footer. Anyway, whatever. Um, but HTML5 can't save you from the CSS when you need to do, uh, you know, Often you need to have a div that wraps something to do something with it. And even though you've got your semantic elements in there, you end up injecting all these divs or whatever just because you need something to attach some styles to or you need something so that you can vertically center something. Um, so that was the HTML side of getting better. Um, CSS Flexbox is helping us a lot. So, um, you know, I'm not sure if you guys have ever tried to do um, header. Uh, okay. Um, so if you try to do a holy grail out, so that's the idea, you've got a header and you've got a sidebar and you've got content and a footer, uh, and trying to do that kind of responsibly. Um, basically, it's actually a real headache to do it if you were trying to do it you know, hand roll it and not following some kind of like, um, you know, protocol. Um, but it, it becomes quite tri trivial to do if you're doing it with um, Flexbox. So this is something um, like it makes uh, CSS uh, a lot more powerful, so you don't have to inject a lot, a lot of these um, wrapper divs when you're dealing with um, if you're using Flexbox. But um, still, sometimes you just need a div. If you've got 
uh, certain styling requirements will you just need to have extra elements in your DOM. So um, how do you how do you get around that? So one solution is having pseudo elements. So it kind of allows you to inject um, inject content into your document from your CSS. So this is good because it allows us to we don't have to create the, all of these elements uh, in our actual markup. We end up uh, we're dealing with like presentation stuff in the CSS, and that's where it belongs. So that, that's good. And uh, it turns out that these, where does where do these elements actually go? They actually appear in the shadow DOM. Um, so shadow DOM is actually um, it kind of <coughs> solves all these problems well. So for example, um, one of the things that well, the, the key benefit of shadow DOM is that it allows you to hide all of your non-semantic markup inside the shadow DOM. So, for example, here I've got this main thing. Um, that's the same thing up there, and I want to wrap it in this div with a, you know, inline star for whatever reason. But it doesn't matter because the thing is that nobody will see this, right? Is this leaving the uh, the original dog intact? Yes. I'll show you in a second. So, um, here let me let me show you. So, if I inspect this. Um, Sorry, main, this one here. So this is the this is the thing that I'm going to be targeting. When I run this code, uh, basically what happens is we get this document fragment, and that's how the Chrome inspector represents a shadow root. So the document fragment, if I open that up, it contains the wrapper content, and then it contains this content thing, which was is then when it's rendered, is replaced with the original main element. Make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so it's actually, I think you, you can even look at the video element in Chrome. Yes, I'll get to that. Get to that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is this a supported ID? Get to that. Nothing is supported. So, yes, so you're right. Nothing is supported in ID. Uh, so, uh, there's a few things that you can do here. Um, so, I mean, obviously, in this one, we're writing H HTML in our JavaScript, and that's just as bad as writing you know, HTML in our CSS or CSS in our HTML. You just keep it where it belongs. So, you can use these things for this is a new thing coming in uh, web components for a template. Um, and, template allows you to create inert pieces of um, DOM content, have them in the, in the DOM, but they, they don't do anything. So if you've got images, you've got scripts or anything like that, they won't initiate loading. Um, and the other cool thing about it is that it allows you to manipulate it as if it was in the DOM um, already. So you can attach classes, you can attach all sorts of interesting stuff, do, do things with it um, without it ever pretend, like ever affecting what's actually written on the page. Anyway, um, if you're using this template, uh, this is basically the, the template way of doing exactly the same thing here. So I've got this div which is wrapping the content, um, but I'm just doing the same thing inside the template, and I just use, I just append the template content to my shadow root, and then it kind of does all the magic and it happens. So oh, look, I'll show it to run it. Great. Um, but this is a, this is really interesting. I think this is one of the coolest features. Uh, and I'm, there's more cooler features than this, but uh, you know I've got limited time today. Uh, but so these content things. Let's say you've got a DOM node. So here I have um, I have this div which contains you know two elements, right? Now, if when I use content just on its own, it will take the entire div, um, including its children, and put it into the shadow DOM if I use content, right? But what if I don't want all of them? So this is a, an interest. So this select uh, attribute on the content <coughs> thing allows you to take just parts of your shadow, uh, parts of your original content, and inject them. So, um, so what I'm what I'm doing here is I've got a heading, I'm got a main, and I want to wrap the heading in this div called with the class green, and I want to wrap this um, this main. Um, with a class content in this div class blue. And in fact, that would actually select anything. So this first one, that's just a normal selector. That's just like selecting the element with the wrong name again. Um, uh, and we've also got this content with the um, you know, dot content. Uh, that's like a class. So they're selectors. So you can do really interesting stuff with that. 
anyway, so if I run that, uh, I end up with this one's wrapped in, in this, and this one's wrapped in that. Now you've also noticed that I've added some styles in here. And what's interesting about this, is does this mean that now that this template's been applied, that everything that, if I have other things on the page that, that happen to have the class green, would these styles be applied to it? And the answer is no. Because um, Shadow DOM allows you to encapsulate your styles. Um, so this is the way, like, in, when you're dealing with an app, I'm sure like everybody's dealt with this stuff before, it, it's very difficult to work in a team on an app when, you, when you've got multiple people uh, yeah, committing CSS stuff and working on different things. You'll have somebody who goes and changes the font on something and suddenly your component's got like, you know, gigantic fonts. And it, it's a real headache um, working in a team on stuff and you have to have like really strict rules on the way that you name, not only like how you do your selectors in the CSS, but also um, how you structure your HTML. And often, you know, you, you have to resort to doing something like this, you know, yeah. having these really long selectors just to, you know, change the color on something. And the thing is, is that this poor person, he's probably got this selector because somebody else has some other selector which was too, spe you know, too specific um, and they had to override it. So it, over time, the length of sele the selectors in your app just gets longer and longer. Uh, and the thing is, is that it's very difficult to even fix this issue because uh, if I go and change this, I'm like, why has it got so much specificity? Uh, I don't know where that's going to break. Now, I mean, there are tools. Um, Neo has a tool called Cactus. Um, Winston's tool. All right, well, he doesn't work with Neo anymore. But he did. Uh, but um, but there's, there are tools which allow you to test this kind of stuff, but nobody does it. Um, well, it's because it's, it's hard. Uh, it's difficult stuff to, to test. Um, and it requires a lot of time as well. Like, you can't expect designers to, like, they're going to have to write code. Um, so with the, the Shadow DOM, it allows us to ignore the rest of the DOM and just do whatever the hell we want inside our own tree. So for example, here I've got this, you know, like you should probably never have this kind of thing, uh, unless you're doing, uh, you, know, you should never do that. So, you know, this kind of thing, if you want to have a, like, a, if this style tag was outside of this um, template, it would apply that red color to everything. And uh, you know, if I wanted to get around that, uh, in fact, I've worked on an app before where they had like top-level horrible things like this, where they would change the color of everything. And so, just to just to begin, you already like just to style any element, you already had to have body in front of everything. So any kind of custom stuff had to have body because we had to override this to get the, over the specificity of anything. Anyway. So uh, this is really cool because if I apply this. Um, even though I've got this um, crazy selector, uh, it still it doesn't affect the rest of the page. So that's cool. Um, but the other interesting thing you'll notice before when we added the link to the um, when we created that link before uh, in the Shadow DOM, it was blue and it looked really horrible. And the reason why is because by default, Shadow DOM effect, um, elements aren't affected by the incoming styles either. So it doesn't pollute the styles of the outside page and it also doesn't um, absorb the styles, at least by default. So for example, um, if I do this, you can see there that it's, you know, uh, even though I have this, this style exists on this page, it didn't apply to that, that item because it's in the shadow DOM. But you can use this, um, this uh, property called uh, apply all the styles, which uh, if we apply, if we set that to true on our shadow root, uh, it allows us to absorb the, the page styles. So that's kind of cool. Does it pollute the page? No. no. Um, it, only, it only takes them. So, and it, not only that, so you'll notice here that um, it, it took the, um, the color and the underline. Um, but there's also this, there's also a tree of properties which get inherited. So. Um, it doesn't include color and it doesn't include underline, but it does include things like font and it, uh, and it does include things like font size. So there's a whole bunch of inheritable properties um, and basically by default it does inherit the, the, uh, the page inheritable properties. So you'll notice here that the font's right, oh, it looks right. I mean you, you didn't see any problems so it's obviously right. But here, if I turn off the, um, 
the style inheritance. That's what, I mean, you've all just opened a, you know, you've started a new web page and you've forgotten to add a style sheet and everything's in Times New Roman. Um, basically, this uh, allows you to kind of like completely reset your style sheet. You can stop any styles coming in and start everything from scratch. Uh, and I'm not sure if anybody's ever tried to build like a widget to load onto like third party pages, but it's a super big headache because you need to, you've got people's styles coming in, changing things, it's really hard. Um, and most people will solve this problem by just displaying things inside an iframe. That's the kind of like the kind of only solution you can get, or an image, um, where you can guarantee that your third-party content will be displayed correctly. Um, but this, um, when you can use it, uh, will be very useful. So there's something else you can do here. So if I've got a, if I've got an element and I want to allow somebody else to be able to style it, I can uh, create. Um, these things will, I don't know, it's not that. Anyway, this is broken, I can't figure out how to make it work. Um, but, so there is a way where you can expose certain, um, certain CSS properties uh, to the outside world. Um, and that's what you can, um, you can tap into you, uh, for a lot of the built-in uh, native elements. So for example here, we've got a progress bar. It looks like that, and if I, you know, that's what it does. This is just me increasing the value. Um, so now here I've got the style sheet. Um, it'll only apply once I hit this custom, once I add this custom class, which I haven't added yet. Um, but basically, I turn off this WebKit appearance thing. Um, so this WebKit appearance thing will trip you up if you're ever messing around with these things. Basically, it's it tells this component to like do all that magic. Aqua stuff. Um, so you've got to turn that off, and then you've kind of got like access to. The, let me show you this. <laughs> so if you look at this element, now this is, I haven't done anything. I haven't created any shadow roots or anything. If I open up this progress bar. You see here it's a document fragment. So it's a, probably a shadow root, and you'll see inside there's a whole bunch of divs, um, and that's actually like the internal implementation of of this component. So if I look here at my, so you can see here, I've got WebKit progress value, WebKit progress bar, and that's what the, that's these two divs. So what I can do is I can style them. Um, so I'm going to add this custom class, and you can see here, um, it's styled. It looks pretty, and it works like a native element. And that's the key: is that uh, this, this is like one of the most important things that the web needs to do and needs to get right is the ability to style uh, and override the functionality of uh, built-in elements. So, and the reason why is because the you know, web's like a platform for, for everything. You know, people are building games in the web, people are building websites, for signing up to things. Um, but, and they, your only option if you want to rebrand uh, a, an HTML component is basically just to completely rebuild it. So who's used like chosen or select two to get pretty drop-down boxes? Anybody? A couple of people. So, uh, but even those things, they're broken. Like it's like the amount of code that goes into just reproducing the functionality of a drop-down box. Uh, it's an awful amount. And a lot of a lot of companies will be produced. They they don't use like chosen or something. They just rewrite it themselves. They build everything in divs, and then like something's wrong. Like for example, it, it won't work correctly on on a mobile, or they'll forget that um, you know escape key should like uh, lose fo uh, lose focus, or and they or the tab button doesn't work. Uh, so they they do all this stuff to make their forms prettier, but they end up being completely useless because you can't use them. Well, not useless, but they. They ruin your experience. You're cruising along good, and then you bam, can't hit tab. Yeah. Um, so this this facility with the shadow DOM allows you to um, override uh, the built-in uh, appearance while still maintaining all of the like built-in behavior. Um, so that's really cool. Uh, this gist here, uh, it's done by Angelina Fabro. She came to Camp JS last year. Um, this year. Um, but this, this is a list of all of the um, Shadow DOM hooks that you can get on uh, some of the HTML5 um, elements. 
So then this is what you're mentioning before the, the video element. So the video element is actually like it's got a whole bunch of little things which you can style and do stuff with. Um, you know, you can you can style the mute button, uh, for example. Um, it's a, and these are all just like divs and stuff. So you can just treat it like regular see it, uh, regular elements. Um, you know, input range, number, etc. So there's a lot of things to hook into. Although there's a problem, I'll post a, post a link to it later. Um, so the there is obviously a problem. Is like you know, well, hang on, I'll get to the next slide. Browser support. So with that previous slide, I mean, all those all those things that you could hook into, they're all custom WebKit things. Um, so whether the Chrome team and Firefox team can agree on all of the custom, I mean, even agree on like the Shadow DOM implementation, let alone, you know, which elements to expose on their video player, etc. I will see. Um, but basically, uh, you can make this work in evergreen browsers. Um, so that means Chrome, um, Chrome Canary, um, Chrome on Android, uh, Firefox, Fire, Safari 6, Mobile Safari, and Internet Explorer 10 Plus. Um, so the thing is, is that these browsers, well, I mean, the one we're going to talk about is Explorer. Basically, uh, like it's going to, it's going to be here soon. Um, well, Eleven's out. out, exactly. Uh, yeah, Google has dropped support for um, IE nine. So you know, you guys, like people are still on IE six and IE seven in these like corporate environments, and part of the reason why is because. People, it, to the, the people who are making the money decisions, it's too expensive for them. They, they see it as a cost to upgrade. But what I want everybody here to do is to make them realize the cost of them not upgrading. You know, there's no amount of money that you'll be able to, like browser, working on browser backwards compatibility crap is one of the worst tasks you can do ever. Like I would prefer to like do manual labor. <laughs> it is an awful job. It's horrible. You know, just because nothing makes any sense and you're just banging your head against the keyboard, uh, it's not good. And so you're going to lose. These companies are going to lose like developer morale. Yeah. Good developers are just gonna, they're gonna see you supporting IE8 and they're just gonna fuck that. Uh, no, it's true. You know, I wouldn't, well, I, I would not work for a company that supports IE8. You know, um, and I, I encourage all of you guys to do the same. You know, because then it makes, you know, it gives the, the fact that they're supporting these old browsers, it gives it a cost. You know, no, and it's not just, yeah, anyway. You just need to complain. <laughs> no, because they probably don't even know that there's a problem. Because everybody's too shy. Developers, no personality, you know. I don't know. Anyway, Shadow is what you're going to be using in the future. So um, basically, I, I really want everybody to like, just start looking into this stuff because, like I said, it will be here sooner. And as soon as, as, soon as these Evergreen browsers hit, so hang on, um, Evergreen browser isn't a browser that updates itself. So as soon as this hits, all of this awful shit that we've been dealing with with old browsers is going to disappear. Like, so we've been dealing with this slow release cycle stuff for so long, but that's as soon as this is this is popular, that will just be a, like it'll be a horrible memory that you'll probably repress. Um, so, you know, it's going it's going to happen. So, you know, we need to start like learning to learn again. You know, I've kind of like you know, the CS, all this stuff's been so slow and you can't use most of it, so you don't even bother learning it anyway. Um, keep up with be left behind. Any questions? Is this part of the W3C specs? Uh, yes. So there's yeah, there's specs for it. Yeah. Um, but I mean, the browsers kind of like have their own. Yeah. And I mean, I, the way I'm making this work is actually through Polymer. Um, so yeah. Similar. Say the same sentence about Polymer. Yeah. So um, Polymer's. Oh, I spoke about it at, at the last meeting. Oh okay. yeah. Yeah. But yeah, Polymer basically enables. Um, well, at least the Polymer platform enables a lot of this new stuff um, in all of these evergreen browsers. So the only one that actually supports a lot of this stuff is natively is Chrome um, and a little bit of Firefox kind of. Um, but the uh, Polymer uh, is a whole bunch of polyfills for a lot of this stuff. Even though they're kind of trying to jam their own framework into it, you can 
strip their framework it's away. Layered. It's yeah, it's layered. It's layered mostly. Um, and or in fact, you can download the um, just the web platform. If you're going to use Browserify as your tool, you can npm install uh, web com uh, polyfill web components, um, and that 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 gets you all the platform stuff. I've made it for Browserify. Browserify. So um, that's cool. Um, yeah. Any other questions? Can you replace native tags like input tags, setup tags? Yeah, yeah. So like with the shadow DOM, yeah, you can just you, you can do anything. Like you can as soon as you add a shadow root, that element mm -hmm. vanishes, and it's only it's only um, yeah. Are, are there like collections of people like publishing these kind of things, like as UI yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so it's not really like a central repository that. Really. Anything like yeah. Yeah. There's um, maybe I don't know. I have I guess we can find it on So I think what it would matters too about web components is that at the moment you have like if you have a beautiful uh, widget in say jQuery mobile and then but you actually you want to use Ember.js or something yeah. and then that's a problem because every component framework has a different widget kind of infrastructure for yeah. layout and for so on. So web components will have a uh, with them you'll have a single kind of market or um, Ecosystem for for widgets that will work across all of these frameworks. Yeah, exactly. Yes, yeah, because because it encapsulates um, style and also like events and all that kind of stuff. Like the idea is we're trying to set it up so that you can build a piece of DOM and it doesn't get interfered with and it doesn't interfere with anything. It's just completely isolated and it can live on your page happily. That's so if you find a widget that is cool, your framework won't matter anymore. You'll be able to yes. use it anywhere. Yes, exactly. Uh, can you comment on this Browserify and Bower? Bower. 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 Well, Bower's just like, wh why? Why? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, it's just like seriously, what does it do? It doesn't do anything. It just, it's just Git clone. Just go to the repo and Git clone it. I don't know. Uh, to say, I say that, but I actually used it um, recently. <laughs> <laughs> I used it recently. It is kind of heavy, but. Um, like, I, I guess the thing is, is that if you're, it's, they're not really comparable because um, Bower kind of bait, it's for pulling over stuff which like isn't uh, modular and kind of finding a way to bake it into your project. Um, while like Browserify or Component um, gives you a facility for like encapsulating your code. It's all about encapsulation. So. Bower does not give you anything, it doesn't control your globals, doesn't do anything. While um, Browserify and Component um, wrap up all of your files in closures automatically and allow you to only infect the code, uh, only infect files with what they with what that file pulls out of your out of your code base, unless of course they you know mess around with the window, but they shouldn't be doing that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Can you add a shadow root into a shadow root? Yes. Um, so there was a content, um, that content tag that you saw. Um, it was, that's where like the normal content goes. But if you've got shadow content, um, it will appear in a shadow. If you put in a shadow tag, um, that any shadow content will appear there. Makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How does JavaScript uh, communicate as like post message and all that uh, stuff? Are, the idea is that you shouldn't, uh, it, you're trying to prevent people from actually okay, so, so that the uh, shadow DOM boundary is designed so that you can't get in or out. Uh, only, right. only stuff that um, that you um, that is purposely exposed. I think you can get like events out and things yeah, like that. I haven't messed around with it. Could you, yeah, for, for any kind of UI control, you need to expose events and things like that. Right? Yeah, so I, there, there'd have to be events, obviously, or maybe you just I, I don't know. I haven't messed around with that yet. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So like, um, so if you've got your own custom event, uh, and you know it's called something like my click, and you've got somebody else who's just done a web component tutorial and they've left the same thing in there, and they're not going to interfere with each other. Uh, yeah. Yep. Very fast data. Say again, sorry. Very fast data. Like the and template. What do you mean? Right now we're using BSD for the template. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so Polymer um, has a proly fill for this thing called um, node bind, and they also add a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, let me show you. 
uh, no, I can't. Um, but go to Polymer Project, and you're, they're, they're trying to get the template system set up so that it's got um, two-way binding and also kind of like a like a handlebar style um, interpolation thing. Um, so yeah, you can pass data in. Um, that's uh, and it works actually. It's quite neat. Um, try it out. Polymer Project. Anything else? Is it like a security context? Like based on, like, is it running in the same domain? Uh, whatever you put in the... I guess so. I don't know. I haven't, I haven't thought about that either. Good question. I don't know. The Windows still isn't cool. Pardon? Windows still isn't cool. Windows still is accessible. Okay. Thank you. Oh, really? I guess so. You so can really get that way. But no, but hang on. The script runs in the window. It doesn't run anywhere else. That's what it does oh, by right, runs. Right. It doesn't... So the scripts, scripts aren't like um, hidden. It doesn't sandbox scripts. Okay, so you have a script tag in there. Maybe, you know what? Um, uh, that's at least how it runs at the moment in Polymer. Now, Polymer is right. kind of like it's sort of making um, what are they called? It like it's kind of got an estimate of that feature. So uh, I thought that they would run in their own sandbox, but they don't. Maybe they do in like in real mode. I don't know. But that would be useful. Yes. Anything else? Cool. All right, well, uh, thanks heaps for coming along. Uh, thanks to all the speakers, that was excellent. Um, we're going to be going to the center somewhere over here. We just follow the crowd, just hang around. <laughs> <laughs> um, what's it called? Singapore, Singapore in there. That one, what's it called? It's a specific place, just follow the people. Yeah, um, yeah thanks. Um, we'll be, there'll be another meetup. Um, January or February. Um, you know, have a good Christmas, have a good New Year's, and I'll see you then.